meeting the other day. That was an experience. Greetings, everyone. It is Tuesday. And on this Tuesday, I have a question for you. Um, and that is, well, let me preface it with a, a little story. I grew up in the church of Nazarene. Uh, I'm the son of a minister. And I guess Greg Tinker, my co co-host Greg Tinker is the son of a minister as well. Greg, I had an experience when I was uh, in my late 20s. I had gone to a, a Sunday night service. This is this is after years of pursuing myself and selfish things, or whatever, but it finally had come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and my life was changed and transformed. And with a group of young adults, we were meeting and seeking God's face and, and doing all we could to draw close to him. So one Sunday night, we had heard a sermon um, on sanctification. And um, as being good churchgoers, we wanted to go out to eat after the service. And so we got out to eat, man. We were like beginning to talk about, you know, the, the sermon, the sermon on sanctification. And we were we were all kind of confused. We were like, man, I don't, you know, I thought I knew what sanctification was or I thought I had a grasp. And, and so we were confused as to, you know, we don't, I don't know if I'm sanctified. I don't know what sanctification is. Hey, could you pass me some, some of the ketchup, you know, and all that kind of stuff in the middle of our meal, all that's going on. But um, here we were and, and the people that I um, was with at that moment had also grown up in, in a church and a denomination that had preached uh, sanctification. So Greg, um, why is it that this term uh, is such a confusing term for people and we have a hard time understanding the S word sanctification? Yeah, I think it is. it's not part of our conversation anymore. You know, you rarely hear the word sanctified or sanctification. And so it's not a term that we commonly use. We talk a lot about salvation. We hopefully understand that. Mm -hmm. But sanctification is something that come, it, it, initial sanctification comes with salvation is, is part of the package, if you will. Yeah. But Talk about a deeper experience after salvation, which we call sanctification. So right. I think yeah. that's just not part of our common lingo anymore. So part of the confusion is it's not part of the common lingo. Um, my pastor, Tony Clemens, preached Sunday uh, a message about sanctification, which was wonderful timing. And one of the things that he did was he talked about what sanctification isn't. Um, I think you probably experienced some of this as did have other people that we grew up hearing that uh, a lot of messages about what sanctification was. And um, and that was that was not it. Sanctification um, wasn't like, you know, makeup or no makeup, um, TV or no TV and those kind of things. Did you experience some of that growing up? Yeah, most definitely uh, growing up in the holiness tradition, holiness was measured uh, to a great extent by the things that we did not do. Uh, some of the things that we did, you know, or things that we did not do, uh, that you wore a certain kind of clothes and you didn't wear a, another kind of clothes. If you were a woman, you certainly never wore pants. If you were a man, right. you didn't wear short sleeves. If you were a woman, you didn't cut your hair. If you were a man, you didn't have long hair. And nobody wore jewelry of any kind. Even married couples didn't wear wedding rings. And so sanctification mm -hmm. was determined by primarily external things that we could see and judge whether a person was truly sanctified or not. Yeah. And so there was there were a lot of negative um, negative messages about what sanctification was. Um, and so a big surprise for me um, was also is that I grew up thinking, I mean, we're talking right now, we're talking about what sanctification isn't and some misunderstandings and some confusion in a minute though, Greg is going to walk us through um, and give us a, an outline of sanctification. I think of something that you could easily comprehend and then apply to your own life. Uh, when I pastored the church, River Watch Community Church in Martinez, Georgia, we, um, our congregation was made up from with from people from all over the United States. It was you know near a military base, and so and we had people who'd grown up in in different traditions of the faith. So I was surprised uh, as we were going to do a study on sanctification, 
And I was surprised as I began to prep for that to realize that sanctification um, is part of the theology of all the Christian denominations, but it, there are some variations. So that was a surprise for me. Um, I grew up thinking sanctification was kind of one of those things that um, um, maybe we had a little trademark on or something like that. But uh, I found out that we did not. Um, so um, I don't know if you experienced yeah. anything like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, growing up in the Nazarene church, what we call the holiness movement, holiness mm -hmm. is all about sanctification. So the emphasis in many faiths was and is the initial part of entering the life of, of Christ, you know, of repentance of sins and of receiving Christ as Lord and then following him being saved, we say, being born again. And it, it, it kind of in some ways stops there because you've gotten what you need, right? You've been yeah. saved. And the church of the Nazarene said, well, yeah, that's true, but there's a deeper, fuller life to be lived and that's sanctification. And so there was this emphasis on sanctification as a way of distinguishing the church of the Nazarene from those that the church of the Nazarene in its inception felt were not any longer preaching that or emphasizing sanctification enough. Right. So, you know, if you are, if you are beginning a, 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 a movement, if you will, a church, a movement based on the emphasis of a particular thing, then you're of necessity going to emphasize that thing to keep your distinctiveness from everyone else. And that's what we grew, you and I grew up in. I got it. Right. That makes sense. And like, a business would or something like that, you know, kind of like they're known for so-and-so this, this yeah. restaurant is known for what's the place in Coleman that they have the, no, it's not the throwing rolls is Lambert's Coleman. Yeah. What is it? They have little orange rolls, you know, all, yeah, the all steak, all steak. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what they promote is the orange rolls. Everybody knows, you know, so this, you're saying the same thing uh, in the holiness movement. Um, our emphasis was on that. And so that's so seemingly we promoted, uh, more so than others. So, Greg, um, will you will you for us and for the people watching, kind of walk us through? Um, I know you talked about a turning point in your life when you understood sanctification as being an experience and a process. And so, would you walk us through from the initial point? We talked about justification um, in our last episode together. Big words made small. Will you kind of walk us through like a, from a, being a non-believer to coming to Christ and then what sanctification, how that, what it is and how it plays out in the life of a believer? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things that we come to a realization of at some point is that our life is not going like we want it to. Uh, mm -hmm. We are not able to live, um, a life that we envision for ourselves, I guess the a better way to say that would be we're commandment breakers. We're, we, we lie, we steal, we don't honor our parents. You know, we don't keep the Sabbath holy. We figure out pretty quickly that we're not too good at just keeping a list of 10 commandments. And what that simply does is show us that there's something in us that needs to be corrected. And so what we come to a realization of is that we are sinners, that we, uh, from our birth, we are depraved people. We live as fallen people. We, we, we can't get it right. Mm -hmm. And so at some point we hear the message that there's someone who came along who preached the message of here's how you can get it right if you follow me. And of course, his name is Jesus. And right. so Jesus presents himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And if we will come to him, we will live a life of satisfaction, right? And so we come to Jesus with our brokenness, with our sin, and we say to Jesus, I haven't gotten it right. I've made a mess of things. And what I need you to do is to forgive me. And then I will follow you. I will belong to you. I'll be your disciple. We call that salvation, or as we talked about before, justification. We come to Jesus just as we are, a broken mess, <laughs> and Jesus accepts us just as we are, and then mm -hmm. he justifies, making us just as if we had never sinned. So all that stuff that came before, 
it's Jesus blotting that out or wiping that out, separating us, separating our, our sins from us as far as the East is from the West. So we call yeah. that justification or initial sanctification. So mm. then the word sanctification, don't be thrown off by that word. It's a big word, but really yeah. it just simply means set apart. But that's set what it apart. means. Yeah, so that's, that's in that's, initial. I wanted to yeah. almost. So in, uh, in, uh, uh, go ahead, yeah, Greg. Go ahead. No, no go I ahead. was going to say that when you started talking, in my mind, I could hear the um, the song, something beautiful, something good. You know, when you were talking about our brokenness, you know, he made something beautiful out of my life. And uh, so continue on. Um, hey, Spence Boston's out there listening to us and uh, Kelly Taylor praying is among the audience out there. And so we'll say hello to them. All right. So initial sanctification, salvation, justification. We've heard the gospel message, man. Woo. Yes. So what happens, Greg? What's what's the how does it continue to play out in our life? So when we come to Christ in initial sanctification, we're now set apart to him. We're no longer living a life of brokenness and sin. It doesn't mean that we are perfect, that we'll never again have an issue. But what it does mean is we have a new orientation now. I'm oriented away from sin and toward Christ. Repentance mm -hmm. simply means turning around and going in the other direction. But even when I do that, I get to a place where I sometimes recognize that there's still an issue in my heart of, of desiring things that are not good for me, things that are not holy, things that are not of God. And right. that usually comes through some ingrained character issue. You know, it's sort of like our whole life brushing our teeth, maybe with using our right hand. And now all of a sudden we, we change and we're going to use our left to brush our teeth. But that's hard to do because yeah. the, the habit is so ingrained in us. Yeah. And so even though we're forgiven of our sins, the habit of sin is ingrained in us. And so we have these character issues that we have lived a whole life forming dispositions, mm -hmm. attitudes, habits. And so we get to a place where we realize, I don't like this disposition in me. I don't like this attitude. I don't like this particular character trait. Something needs to happen that's deeper. And mm -hmm. we call that entire sanctification, meaning that we fully surrender ourselves to Christ we fall at his mercy basically and say, you know what? Something deeper needs to happen. There needs to be a deeper devotion. I need to give myself to Christ more fully so that my heart is entirely purified of these habits, dispositions, attitudes, character traits. And so within that, through grace, Christ purifies my heart. So now I am sanctified wholly or set apart to him entirely consecrated set apart to him so that my devotion now moves ent entirely to to loving christ and uh, doing what he, it is that he has called me to do so that is a little different in, than justification in the sense of i may still have those you know ingrained habits or attitudes or dispositions but now in sanctification i come to him and I say, God, purify my heart so that my devotion is only for you. And if mm. you want to go back to your singing analogies, Randy, we could sing, I'm devoted to you, uh, perhaps. <laughs> you know. uh, Greg, and I think uh, <clears throat> the term refiner's fire, you know, um, it, it talks about, you know, re purify my heart, you know, and the dross and, and things. And so that's uh, excellent. Uh, just, um, yeah, we repent. We turn away from our, our wicked ways. Uh, we come to Christ. And so we're set apart. And you're saying now there comes that point. And I, and I love that where you, where you talk about that we're used to brushing our teeth right handed and suddenly we're trying to brush them left handed. And it is hard to make those adjustments. And what is, the scripture says uh, to be conformed not to this world, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I think that's a part of what you're saying. We, we change and and our focus changes. So, um, yeah, we realize that, man, there's, I've got a, uh, yeah. And that experience, um, of total surrender. Um, if God, if you want me, uh, you know, to brush my teeth with my left hand, 
um, I'll do it, you know, instead of trying to do what I want to do and brush my right hand. So is that it, Greg? I mean, you know, all right, he comes in, our hearts are cleansed. Um, and that surrender of the will to, to him, you know, and again, sometimes the term entire sanctification is, is a big word and it gets one of the, for me, okay. One of the, the, the negative things that happened is that, um, when people talk about entire sanctification, that it made it sound like it was a, a one and done thing. You know, I was saved, I was sanctified. Right. And then I was entirely sanctified and that's it. There's nothing else that happens from that. But that's not kind of what I misunderstood that, I think. Can you walk us through what happens after, after that? Yeah. I, 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 so there, there is this experience that we have. Okay. So mm -hmm. let me illustrate it again with the disciples before and after Pentecost. Yes. So before Pentecost, they're living in the flesh and Jesus told them that. Remember, he says they go to the, they've all sworn that they're going to defend Jesus, that they're going to stay with him regardless. They'll go to the death with him. And Jesus says, you guys don't really know what you're talking about. So they go to the garden of Gethsemane to pray. Jesus is praying because his life is on the line. And he tells the disciples, pray, I, I need you to pray pray with me. And when he goes back to check on them, they're dead asleep. Now they've just sworn that they would go to the death with him. Right. But now, now yeah. Oh, yeah. when he needs a dead so <laughs> their heart is willing, but their flesh is weak. So Jesus says to them, your, your spirit is willing. I know your hearts guys. I know you mean well, but your mm -hmm. flesh is weak. So then after Christ's death and resurrection, he comes back to the disciples and he says, now that I'm going to be going to the Father, I am going to send the Holy Spirit and he won't just be with you. He will be in you. He will empower you to live the life that I have called you to live. And so before Pentecost, they're weak because they're living out of their flesh. You know, they love Jesus. They're saved, if you will. But mm -hmm. after Pentecost, they've been filled with the Spirit of Christ. They're totally devoted to him. And now they're empowered to live the life that before they could not live. So that's really what it means to be sanctified is to come to that place where we're no longer living out of our flesh. We're trying to do it on our own, but we come mm -hmm. to Jesus and we say, you know, Jesus, I know you sent your spirit to live in me and I want to be fully surrendered to your spirit so mm -hmm. that I'm empowered by you to live the kind of life that you called me to. And it shouldn't be something that we're we're anxious about or overcome with guilt or condemnation. Jesus came to set us free from that. He came mm -hmm. to give us his spirit to take up residence in us. And that's a good way of looking at it. If if, if we think about our uh, our body as the temple, as it, it is said, in the temple having various rooms. And mm -hmm. so what Jesus comes to do is to take up residence in our temple fully in every room so that there is nothing sort of bifurcated or compartmentalized. In other words, what I mean by that is I don't have a sort of area of life that I live apart from Christ. I don't have a recreational life that I live apart from Christ or a marital life. I live apart from Christ or whatever. My whole entire life comes under the devotion to Jesus Christ. Now every room of the house belongs to him and I am under his direction and authority and I live that way. I'm sanctified. I'm set apart to him totally. Great illustration. And the part um, about, yeah, trying to do it in the flesh and realizing that, man, I, I can't, you know, and that we've got to have God's Holy Spirit working in us to make those things happen. And that was one of the things that, <clears throat> for me, um, <clears throat> hearing it taught or about the fact that it was, you know, a one, two, salvation, sanctification, without the part of the process, you know, the progression of sanctification, the continuation um, yes. was, a, was a tough thing because I knew I found out that even after I surrendered, you know, 
and, and, and prayed for the Holy Spirit to, to cleanse me and change me that I was still encountering some things that were tough to deal with. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I thought I had surrendered everything. Um, you know, when we, when I used to go through, um, <laughs> I better clarify this. Um, I started to say when I used to go through people's houses, um, the work we did, my niece, Lindsay and I, we, um, would go through, um, places that people would give us permission, like an old home that they had that uh, they were going to sell or tear it down to go through the house. <clears throat> and, uh, we would purchase, uh, different things like we would purchase, you know, doors and, and, um, fireplace mantles and things, but we also had the, the thing, the possibility to go through and just look out. We would discover other things that in essence, you know, I'd, I'd already made a deal about the, the, um, um, the doors and the fireplace mantle, but we're going through the house. You'd go, Oh, what about, what about this? You know, something else would, would, you would see something. And for me, that's the kind of a thing. It's like, it would pop up and, and you're like, I've surrendered everything to him. But then it, this issue, you know, like, does that make sense? You walk into a, a new room, and there's something in that room. And um, so I, I don't know. I yeah. mean, I muddied the waters with that. But um, um, I'm just trying to say that I get it. I experience what you're talking about. And uh, it is a daily surrender, you know, every day. <clears throat> um, staying surrendered and staying committed to him. Hey, Greg, is it uh, one of the things that, um, that for me, um, I talked about earlier that there are different theologies of sanctification, you know, like within the holiness tradition, there's this theology. And I was really surprised to find out that all the Christian denominations have uh, theologies of sanctification. So is it possible for us to maybe um, have different theologies of sanctification, but at the same time, all be working together towards the same thing? Does that, does that question make sense? All right, let me, does, let me and I think that oh, go ahead. Yeah, it does, Randy. And and I think that one of the things that every Christian faith talks about is that there is this deeper life with God that is to be pursued. And right. I like the way that Oswald Chambers says it. Oswald right. Chambers has a term that he used uses called abandonment that we basically abandon ourselves to God. It, and if you want to think of it in these terms, we fall into his arms. We trust him with our yeah. life. Oh, we yeah. abandon yeah. ourselves to him. And the point that you made earlier is a good one to make is that though there is what we would call a crisis experience where we come to Christ in sanctification, where we have this moment of realization of, I need a, a, a deeper walk a, a greater filling of the Holy spirit. But that doesn't mean that there's never an issue after that or never a struggle after that. That doesn't mean that we will never again face something in our life, uh, that attitude, that disposition, a particular besetting sin, as the Bible would say. But what it does mean is that we have power now to deal with that as we walk through that, that, that we now have uh, within us the living Christ to instruct us to walk with us through that. And we, we grow, we mature. So there's room, there's room for error as we're growing. Mm -hmm. Just as a child, you know, learning to do things or, you know, they're not going to do everything perfectly. There's room for right. growth. And so sanctification should not be understood to me as I think you and I maybe did growing up that once you have that experience, you don't ever have any issues anymore. You know, that you, you've got it all, nothing else yeah. to do. Well, no, um, we come to that fuller surrender to that abandonment, but that just means that we're now empowered in a greater way to deal with the things that we have to deal with. So it's not a perfection in the sense of perfection of performance. What it is right. though right. Is, is a Christian mature, able to, to live with a, a a greater degree of character reformation. Oh, I, I like that character reformation. And um, <clears throat> Greg, I thank you for sharing that because you know we, you mentioned sanctification, uh, the term meaning set apart, and um, and then you said that how that we all um, 
our brothers and sisters of other denominations in the Christian faith, you know, it, we, we, I love to hear um, good sermons and um, talking about a deeper walk and people pursuing. Uh, we may not all use the same terminology. That's where I'm trying to get with this. But I think that um, if you listen, we can hear the call to a deeper walk with, with Christ. And Oswald Chambers, Greg mentioned Oswald Chambers. If you haven't read any of his writings, I encourage you to check those out. Greg, do you have any last words? Um, we're getting close to the 30 minute mark here. And I think we'll go ahead and begin to wrap up because you've walked us through the timeline <clears throat> um, from justification, salvation, you know, repenting, turning away from, um, and then to the point where that total surrender, entire sanctification, the crisis, a crisis experience, and then the ongoing um, process. In all this, our walks and our when we experience those things aren't necessarily all going to match up. That was a, a fallacy for me that you know growing up is kind of like you had to have I'm, this. Here's the date I was, you know, saved, and here's the date I was sanctified. And in my experience, you know, when I testified to it, my testimony had to kind of match up with their testimony, kind of thing, you know. But it, it doesn't. God works. Things kind of play out a little differently in each one of our lives and, and stuff. So, any last comments or thoughts you want to add to to this discussion? Yeah, I think that the point is not to necessarily emphasize experiences as much as it is our walk with Christ. The Bible commands us to walk with Christ in first John chapter two, verse six, those who live in Christ Jesus, who claim to live in Christ Jesus, who claim to be followers. One version says should walk as he walked or another version says should live their lives as he lived his. And so it's in the living. It's not the experiences are good and they're appropriate, but it's in the living. And Christ is a good teacher. He treats all of us as individual students. So there's not this sort of this, uh, uh, if you will, communal kind of experience that we all have to be the same, dress the same, look the same, talk the same. Christ <laughs> treats us as individuals, just like he did with his own disciples, right? He right. treated every one of them yeah. as an individual. And he does us the same. So we don't have this cookie cutter approach to things. So allow yourself room to grow and for Christ to be your individual teacher, because mm -hmm. that's who he is. And he wants to love us in that way. So don't let it be a point of stress. Let it be a point of joy, of growth in Christ as you follow him. Greg, just what, when you said that about the students and teaching, it made me think about, you know, in the classroom, how that, uh, especially for me in a, in a math class <laughs> or a algebra class, how that um, a lot of people, they would get it, you know, how you could tell they had already gotten it and they're, they're way ahead of me. And then, then at some point, Oh, that's what you're talking about. And I, I, that's, that's beautiful because it is the way I think in our spiritual journey is that, yeah. So some people, some people are, um, you know, they're, they're they're walking and they're picking up on some things and you know others we're we're walking here and but we're all like you said he is taking us all individually and and working with us and so i'm so grateful for that greg thank you for taking the time uh to be with us today for preparing uh with us uh, susan broadhead uh, she also said thank you um that you know she'd experienced some of the same things and i appreciate people like susan out there who are ministering and making a difference and um, in the lives of other people and serving as a pastor. I think I got that right. I'm not sure the congregation, but um, and in the lives of the young people on the in, in South Alabama. Greg, um, we want to, for those who don't know, we um, did a thing maybe a year ago, or is it two years ago, about your church's involvement with the wells in Malawi. And I'd like to, would you be willing to come back maybe in a week or so and give us an update on all that? Maybe go back and let's re-explore it for those who have not heard the story. But then you shared with me earlier uh, an update about the number of wells have been built. 
Uh, would, would you be interested in doing that? Most definitely. You bet. Would love to. Well, good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. This has been a, a... All right, you got to do your part, all right? This has been a big words. Made really small. <laughs> <laughs> we at least hope it has, man. We hope that uh, this conversation has helped you have a deeper understanding of the big word sanctification and made it small enough for you to understand and apply to your life. May God bless you. Thank you for watching. Join us again for some not so crazy talk. Um, till then, keep on keeping on.